thank you very much for allowing me to, to talk today about uh, surgery for spasmodic dysphonia. Um, I'm not going to go into every operation that's uh, available, but I am going to talk about a couple surgeries uh, that uh, I think are quite useful in the condition. By the way, I'm Dr. Gerald S. Burke. I'm at UCLA um, Center for the Voice and Swallowing, and I'm the Professor of Surgery and Chair Emeritus of the department. So I wanted to spend a minute to talk about abductor dystonia uh, first. Um, you know, these are people that um, unfortunately have increased tone and spasm of the muscle that opens the vocal cords for breathing. Uh, and also we open our vocal cords when we uh, make unvoiced phonemes. Unfortunately, this muscle can go into spasm, and when that happens, the patients have difficulty going from an unvoiced phoneme to a voiced phoneme. So instead of being able to say the word help, which is a sound, then followed by the help sound, they usually go help, and there's a, a long delay, and it makes it very difficult for them to get um, a sentence out without a number of uh, breaks in those uh, uh, aspirated words. Um, because the PCA muscle, and you can see that here, this is a back view of the larynx, because the PCA muscle is on the back side of the larynx, it, become, it can be very hard to inject with Botox. Um, the, the other reason that it's difficult to treat is because we need this muscle to open our vocal cords for us to breathe. And so there's a very fine line between treating the muscle to, so that it won't be into spasm and treating too much so that the patients have difficulty breathing as well. So what we have found, what I have found, is that in a number of patients that have mild to moderate abductor dystonia, putting some implants into the vocal cords with a type one bilateral thyroplasty can uh, improve their ability to communicate quite a bit. Um, and um, the good thing about this procedure is that um, you wouldn't necessarily have to go all the way out to UCLA to do it. You can um, certainly, uh, if the, the laryngologist in your local community is familiar with doing bilateral thyroplasties, putting implants in the larynx, <clears throat> he can probably do it for you right where you are and uh, save a trip out here. So we did a retrospective chart review of all the cases of abductor dystonia treated with this technique over a 10 year period. Um, and we looked at the voice handicap index before and after treatment and the voice related quality of life before and after. Um, and uh, Here's basically uh, the quality of life results. And you can see that over here in the uh, right column here on the screen, that the patients that underwent the procedure had significantly statistical improvement um, in um, their quality of life after the procedure. Uh, and so and you can read what some of the parameters were. I have trouble speaking loudly. I run out of air. I don't know well, uh, what will come out when I'm speaking. I'm anxious, I'm depressed, I have trouble using the phone. And you can kind of go down the list, but uh, anything greater than 0 0.05 is usually considered to be statistically significant. And you can see these are all the way over at 0 0.004. And again, the voice handicap index, uh, which uh, had a number of parameters such as my voice makes it difficult for people to hear me, I run out of air, et cetera, were uh, much improved with this procedure. So the people that underwent this over that 10 year period were only six, so it's a small study. One third were male and uh, the mean age was about 40 plus or minus 10 years. And the follow up time was two months to 10 years. Uh, Nearly all the parameters improved uh, during this vocal fold medialization. Uh, and the patients who were medialized for greater than four years reported long-term improvement. 
So it does appear to help in, and I underline in red here, mild to moderate. In some patients, and sadly, who have really severe abductor dystonia, um, even doing this particular procedure really won't make any much of a difference. Um, I usually give them a temporary office injection first to make sure that the procedure um, will actually help them. And the question becomes, how, why does it help? How does it help? And I think the reason is that the implants force you to use a little more lung pressure in order to set the vocal cords into vibration. And somehow that uh, additional lung pressure, uh, probably through the herring brewer reflex, which are the pulmonary stretch receptors, plays a role in helping the larynx close a little more quickly for those unvoiced phonemes. Um, of course, there's uh, some bias in the study. It was a retrospective study. It was really just my experience, and there were a small number of subjects. But uh, clearly, it's something for those of us, for those of you that have a, a mild to moderate form of the disorder to consider. So I'd like to move on to SLAD-R, uh, selective laryngeal adductor denervation and re -innervation. Um, certainly, uh, I would say at the outset that if a patient is obtaining good results and is happy with their Botox therapy, then really there's no reason to look for alternatives. I've had many patients in my practice that have undergone shots for over 20 years and are happy with that and are not really looking for any other solution. Unfortunately, sometimes the, the continued Botox is not quite as rosy. And these are just some of the reasons that some of the patients really wanted to try something else. Uh, I put a cure here where I'm not really curing the SD, and even in patients that undergo successful SD surgery, I can still hear when I listen to them because I'm very used to listening to their symptoms, some degree of, of uh, abnormality in their voice, but you'll hear maybe later on uh, some of them. The ups and downs of Botox, as you know, some patients have a, a long breathy interval and then they all of a sudden have a very short interval where their voice is good. Um, Botox in a few patients, they can get um, allergies to it. It can just stop uh, working. Certainly, um, Botox is an expensive procedure. Um, sometimes I, half jokingly say it's really an annuity to the doctors that do it. Um, there are uh, swallowing difficulties that occur. Um, and not every physician that knows how to inject Botox are close to patients. So the concept that uh, we, I'd like to present is a surgical analog of bilateral Botox injection. And before I do that, I, I want to make a point that spasmodic dysphonia is a neuromuscular problem. It's really not a cartilaginous problem. And I know that there are procedures out there that uh, significantly change the skeletal structure of the larynx, the cartilaginous structure. But my experience has been that they don't really help. And it also makes it very, very difficult to inject Botox once you cut into the cartilage. And, uh, you know, there's this saying in medicine, above all, do no harm. I think some of these patients can be harmed by, uh, by this type of procedure. Uh, the muscle of the vocal cord, the TA muscle, the thyroretinoid muscle, where we inject Botox, is right under the thyroid cartilage. So it's easily accessible, as is the nervous structure. A little bit in the past here, you know, Dr. Dito sect, resected one of the RLMs, uh, but unfortunately discovered a high incidence of recurrences uh, thought to be due to regrowth of the nerve and also spasm of the other side of the larynx that continued. Uh, many of these patients underwent laser vocal thinning with some harshness in their voice afterwards. Uh, Dr. Crumley presented uh, re innervation of the distal stump after um, <clears throat> vocal cord uh, 
RLN resection, but um, again, the results were never really presented. Uh, Dr. Netazerl um, discussed enfolcing the RLN on one side, but there was unpredictable breathiness, and many of these patients, for some reason, had to be uh, treated by medialization, with a proportion of them having their symptoms return. And then in uh, Japan, Dr. Iwamura reported on unilateral selective RLN section without re -innervation. But as we know, uh, SD in Japan is a very rare disorder, and it's hard to really understand what uh, he was reporting on. So the procedure really involves a, an advanced understanding of the laryngeal microneuroanatomy, uh, which has really led to the surgical technique. And here's my little arrow. You can see the nerve comes up from behind here and gives off its branch to the PCA, which we just talked about, and then heads up into the larynx and gives a branch here to the TA muscle uh, called the anterior branch, gives off a little tiny branch to another muscle that closes the larynx. And this is the, the muscle that, the TA muscle where we inject the Botox. Uh, surprisingly, th this paper in France was presented for the first time not that long ago, in the late 80s or mid 80s, and it showed for the first time the intralaryngeal branch of the recurrent laryngeal nerve. You can see it right here with the little fibers that come off of it that go to uh, different places within the TA muscle. Um, and this is the intralaryngeal adductor branch of the recurrent laryngeal nerve. So I have to say at the uh, right now that the study was actually studied, uh, this procedure was actually studied in uh, animals before uh, human beings. And um, these animals actually um, gave their lives so that we could help people um, with this condition. And um, um, this, they were studied in the canine. Um, and we should all be grateful to the ability that we have such a similar larynx to, uh, to dogs that uh, we were able to really do this. But what the study showed is that at the very high end when we stimulate the nerve, that the animals actually sounded like they were in spasm. But actually, once we cut the nerve to the TA muscle, whether we re it or not, it didn't matter how much stimulus we gave to the nerve, the animals never sounded like they were in spasm. The subglottic pressure never went up. And that was the clue that possibly we could adapt this to human beings and develop a similar type of response. Uh, this is just shows that the vibration of the larynx before denervation and after was very similar. So this is what, it, oops, let me back up. So this, this is what the study looks like in humans. Here's a human larynx here. We make a little trapdoor window here in the back. And um, basically, we divide the nerve. We pull the proximal end of the nerve outside. And then we bring down a branch of the adsa cervicalis and sew that to the distal part of the nerve. And what that does is it prevents the, um, the old nerve from growing back in and also prevents the muscle from atrophying. And here's the, what the ansa cervicalis is. It's a nerve that we use for laryngeal re quite frequently. And uh, it has uh, two branches here, uh, the nerve to the sternohyoid and the nerve to the sternothyroid. These are the branches down here. And we use one of these. And we rotate it up into the larynx, which is over here. And um, all the rest of the branches, however, remain connected. So 1993 was the first patient that we underwent surgery. Uh, and we reported on 21 patients back in 1999. We had to wait six years before our first report because uh, as Dr. Dito found, early results of treatment of spasmodic dysphonia with surgery aren't really very uh, accurate. And uh, over time, a lot of his patients recurred. Um, 15 patients had just denervation alone, and another six had denervation uh, with some uh, cutting of the LCA. Here's the procedure. 
Uh, and I know it always looks kind of yucky to see um, a live patient, but basically in this first uh, slide here, you can see here's the nerve right here that we've uh, identified and it's underneath here. And then we put a stitch under the nerve. Here's a, a small 4-0 silk. And here you can see the nerve with a stitch underneath it. Uh, we tie the stitch and cut the nerve. And then we pull the stitch and the nerve outside the larynx. And here you can see, hopefully, this little nubbin sticking up here with this little axon right here. And this is the distal portion of the uh, anterior division of the recurrent laryngeal nerve. And then in this final slide, we're showing you that we've anastomosed the uh, branch of the ansa to uh, the nerve in this slide and pulled the uh, uh, proximal portion of the nerve outside. And that's basically the surgery in a nutshell, although in order to accomplish all of this, especially on both sides, it takes about three hours to do it carefully. So, um, this was uh, the analysis of our data, and I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this. We've published a number of patients' papers over the years, um, but uh, we used uh, the VH10, the Boys Handicap Index 10 score, uh, which preoperatively was 35, and um, postoperatively the average went down to 12, uh, which was a 22.9. Anything more than six points is usually considered uh, significant. Uh, and our criteria was a 10 point uh, reduction. Um, in this initial study, 83% of patients had at least a 10 point change. And you can see by this pie chart, uh, preoperative versus postoperative, what happened uh, to many of the patients. Uh, you can see that there were very few patients that were left with uh, severe voices, and many of them were really quite good. This is the, the change. Um, this is just uh, patient responses to, my speech is more fluent, 92% agreed. I still have vocal spasms, 73% uh, disagreed and uh, strongly disagreed. Uh, about 10% were undecided at that point. Uh, I need Botox treatments. 90% um, of the patients no longer needed Botox. And I still have some swallowing difficulties. This was around 60% 60, 60 of the patients. Um, but um, over the years, I think we've, uh, we've changed the procedure now. And it's very sim seldom that we have any long-term um, uh, swallowing issues with the procedure. We used to cut a lot of the LCA muscle, and now we do uh, a very modest uh, resection of that tiny muscle. And as I said here, how have we changed it? More conservative LCA myoma myomectomies. Um, we continue to refine the surgery, although at this point we've done hundreds and hundreds of patients, and it's pretty consistent. Um, in fact, at one time we needed to have patients with no Botox on board, uh, that's not really the case because we can find the nerves without stimulation. And uh, almost all the patients stay uh, two days in the hospital, the day of surgery, and then one more day to make sure that they're swallowing adequately, and then they can go home. Um, occasionally, um, we will do a unilateral. If we um, have a patient who lives close by, um, or can't afford to have up to three to six or even nine months sometimes of breathiness while the new nerves are growing in. <clears throat> um, we performed uh, probably, now we're up to probably 25 or 30 unilaterals. And I think what we found is that um, maybe about 50% of them actually needed to have a second procedure on the other side. But we were successfully able to do that. So who's a candidate? Adductor spasmodic dysphonia, uh, three-hour general anesthesia. Cervical dystonia, where the neck is being pulled down, is really a contraindication because that's the nerve that we use. 
And if that nerve is dystonic, it's going to transfer its dystonia to the larynx. <clears throat> and some patients with mixed dystonias uh, would, could make the abductor component worse. Uh, some patients with tremor, if it's a tremor that's uh, related to the dystonia, they will get better. If it's a tremor that's not really related to the dystonia, the tremor still stays, and although we can take away the spasm, they'll still have some tremor. Um, age. I have done patients in their early 70s, and some of them have done very well. Some don't do as well. Um, four of 81 patients were over 70 at that point, um, and the VH10 change was about 25 points. So, but nevertheless, nerves don't grow back together as readily uh, past the about the age of 65. So I'd like, I'd like to play a couple, two patients for you that underwent the procedure. This is preoperatively. Oh, I work in a very busy office, very, very difficult. My words out to talk and breathe and <sighs> Botox has not worked. This is uh, 53 months postoperatively. Um, I got spasmodic dystonia several years back. Um, I was the secretary at the time. Very, very difficult to be on the phone all day and talk to people all day with no voice. Um, this is a male preoperatively. Real classic. Okay. Uh, actually, it started uh, when I was uh, I was in later, and then um, I noticed that I dropped about four oats off the top of my range, and I thought. And then finally, 54 months post I noticed it the first time, actually, because I, am a, I was a singer. And what I did was lead, I was leading uh, music in a church service. So you can see that some patients and many patients can actually end up with very good, useful voices that um, unless you were very sensitive to listening to patients with SD, you wouldn't really know that they had any voice breaks or any uh, excessive stress and strain in their voice. Um, so the typical post-operative course, uh, one month, very breathy, swallowing almost normal at about three weeks, but still some difficulty. Three months, pos possibly still breathy, swallowing well, occasional choking on liquids. Uh, six to nine months, voice stronger, full approximation of the vocal cords, and then a year, a maximal improvement. Most of the voices come back usually within about three to four or five months. So in conclusion then, a number of manifestations of SD exist and experience and diagnosis is paramount. Uh, there's a variety of treatment options which exist um, and Botox continues to be the preferred primary therapy for adductor SD. As I uh, mentioned, mild abductor dystonia, uh, abductor dystonia can be improved by a combination of surgery and Botox. And finally, treatment should be based on a number of critical factors, including severity of the symptoms, the age and health of the patient, voice requirements, technical concerns, and the training and experience of the treating physicians. So that's uh, really all I really had to say. Thank you for your attention. And I hopefully you'll be around for some questions. Thank you. Bye-bye.